Good afternoon, students. So in this video, I'm going to go over how to do an outline and also pre-writing strategies so to kickstart your writing. So if you've ever had gotten stuck on writer's block, not being able to think about what your next thought or idea is going to be, well, that's what this presentation is going to be about. I will go over all the different kinds of pre-writing strategies so that you never have to have writer's block again. And then I'll also, after you do your uh, pre-writing, then I'll also go over how to do an outline. And so I'm going to go over each pre-writing strategy and give an example of how that pre-writing strategy can actually be used in writing a paper. So um, this will cover weeks four, five, and six of your LAPU English 101 class in which I go over pre-writing and I also go over um, what motivates writers to write. And so this would be week four, five, and six. And I hope you enjoy this video on creativity writing. And I hope that this video motivates you to write. So here I will share my screen and we will go over writing. Crushing Writer's Block, your journey to fearless writing through pre-writing and also what motivates writers to write. Week four to six wrap up. Pre-writing strategies. So we're gonna go over many different kinds of strategies like rewrite, pre free writing, brainstorming, clustering, and mindfulness, relaxation. All of these different kinds of techniques will help you create ideas for your, video, uh, for your papers. So as I go over each pre-writing activity, I will discuss and give examples of how each pre-writing strategy works and how each pre-writing strategy can be applied in helping you create ideas for your paper to avoid writer's block. And then I will show you how to organize your ideas into a sentence outline. The first kind of pre-writing activity is brainstorming. Imagine you're planning a blog post about healthy breakfast ideas. Grab a piece of paper and jot down every idea that comes to mind, no matter how wild. Smoothie bowls, avocado toast, Greek yogurt with berries, homemade granola bars, quinoa breakfast bowl, omelet with veggies. Don't hold back. The crazier the idea, the better. So your main topic would be healthy breakfast ideas and just write whatever comes to your mind. When you think of the, the words breakfast ideas, what comes to mind? smoothies, avocado toast, Greek yogurt, okay, and then write it all down, hodgepodge. Don't try to think about any grammar. That's called brainstorming. Clustering. You're preparing a presentation on climate change. So the main topic is climate change. So you start with climate change and you write climate change in the center of your paper. And then you draw lines from the climate change and then you write related ideas related to climate change, such as global warming, extreme weather, a sea level rise, carbon emissions, hurricanes, melting ice caps, effects on coastal cities. And you have climate change in the middle of that page, and you have uh, global warming, extreme weather, sea level details, carbon emissions, hurricanes, and it's like building a web of interconnected uh, concepts. And if you want, you can even draw a circle around. So in the central circle, you put your main ideas. And in your outer circles, you write all interconnected ideas or reasons that you associate with climate change. So that's known as clustering. Tackling being overwhelmed. You're working on a research paper about artificial intel intelligence. And so here you put artificial intelligence in your, the center of your paper. And then you create a checklist with tasks like research AI history, explain machine learning, discuss ethical concerns, provide real world examples. Tackling these smaller tasks one by one makes the overall project seem less daunting. Mind mapping. Imagine you're, at, you're tasked with writing an essay about the benefits of exercise. You start with the central idea benefits of exercise. And then you branch out. This is very similar to brainstorming. 
and clustering. And then you branch out with subtopics like physical health, mental health, social benefits, reduced risk of chronic diseases, stress relief, improved mood, connecting with others. So it's like creating a visual roadmap of your essay topic. Free writing. You're about to write a short story with the prompt lost in a forest. Set a timer for 10 minutes and just write without stopping or worrying about grammar. Let your imagination run wild. The leaves rustled underfoot as I stumbled through the dense forest. A feeling of unease settled in my chest and every snap of a twig sent shivers down my spine. I looked up and all I could see were towering trees that seemed to touch the sky. And I remember when I went to college, our teacher took the whole class outside and then, uh, and then everybody had to, to close our eyes and then walk 10 steps in any direction. Then she told us, stop. So, after, so we closed our eyes and we walked 10 steps in all these different directions. So then, then she said, okay, open your eyes. And then here she said, wherever you are, and we had our notebooks and everything, then we had to spend 10 minutes writing whatever we were looking at. I happened to be looking at an ant hill. And so I spent 10 minutes just describing how the ants came in and out of the ant hill for 10 whole minutes. So when you do free writing, you just get lost in your writing for 10 minutes and you don't think about grammar and you just free write. Uh, whatever comes to your head. So that is another form of pre-writing to get your creative juices going because you relax your mind. You make all of the filters come down and then you just let the creative juices come through. And so that's what I, and actually that was pretty fun. So the, the, the key to being creative is you have to let your mind relax. So crafting your pre-writing oasis, imagine you're getting ready to write a personal reflection on your favorite childhood memory. Set the scene by finding a cozy spot near a window, lighting a scented candle reminiscent of your memory, and having a cup of hot cocoa by your side. Create an environment that transports you back in time and sparks your nostalgic feelings. Creative activities. Creative warm-up activities. Starting a poem about sunset, kickstart your creativity with a quick warm-up. Write down the first five words that come to mind when you think of sunsets. So you put the sunsets at the center of your paper, because that's the main topic, and then around, around the words sunsets, write down any other words that you associate with sunsets. For example, fire, color, horizon, serenity, goodbye. Now use these words to jumpstart your poem with a burst of imagery. Questioning. Start by asking questions related to your topic. For example, uh, if you're going to write about uh, AI, what, how, has technology, how has technology changed classroom dynamics? What are the benefits of using educational apps? What are the potential drawbacks? of excessive screen time for, for students. How do teachers adapt their teaching methods with technology? And then the answers to these questions will become your thesis statement and your reasons. Listing. Now let's switch to listing. Write down key points, examples, and subtopics related to your questions. Interactive whiteboards online collaborate. In other words, how has technology changed teaching, right? So that was what we did Eve, for the questioning. Or how, how has technology, the pandemic, online teaching changed the way uh, teachers teach or changed the way students learn? So that's what we got with questioning. Now we're, we're going with the same topic, we're going to list some of the answers to those questions, such as one of the ways in which teaching has changed is now we have interactive whiteboards. Now we have online collaboration tools. We have personalized learning platforms. We have virtual reality in education. We have e-learning versus traditional learning. Digital divide and accessibility challenges for low-income students. So by questioning and listing, you're delving into deep into your topic 
and exploring various aspects and generating a wealth of ideas you can later organize into a cohesive essay. Dealing with perfectionism. Some of you revise, I mean, it's very tempting to, to want this perfect essay with no grammar mistakes, but what happens is that if you try to aim for perfection, perfectionism, you freeze up your brain because your brain becomes so anxious that it has to be perfect, and then pss, that causes the writer's, writer's block. So you have to learn to let go of that perfectionism and just let it and just relax because it's only through relaxation when you let it go that you can then have uh, you can get rid of per, uh, writer's writer's block. So here, here here's an example: writing writer, writer, writing a short story about an unexpected adventure. Give yourself permission to write terribly in the beginning. Set a timer for 15 minutes and just pour out your ideas even if your ideas are cliche or disjointed. It's about getting the ideas on paper without worrying about perfection. Although for, for many of us, that's easier said than done because it's so hard to break the habit of perfectionism, and I'm guilty of that too. It's really hard for me to simply just relax and then just write down everything with bad grammar, especially since I'm an English teacher and I make a living correcting everyone's grammar, but that's only when you get to the final draft that we're doing. Remember that when we do the writing process, we have three stages. You have the pre-writing stage in which you forget about grammar, then you have the writing the rough draft, and then you have the final draft. And so when you go from writing the rough draft to from writing to rewriting, so pre-writing, writing, rewriting, those are the three stages of the writing process. So as you go from stage two to stage three, in other words, as you go from uh, writing to rewriting, that's when you cover grammar. That's when you concern yourself with grammar. But in the pre-writing stage, you have to learn to let go of the grammar in order to let your creative juices flow. Be happy when you write. Remember, these Pre-writing activities are meant to kickstart your creativity, and then you can organize your thoughts later. And so that, in that way, when you let your mind relax, that helps you overcome writer's block. And then feel free to adapt uh, clustering, mind mapping, brainstorming to, to, to fit your individual personal style. Everyone has a different way of writing, and it's and it's an adventure for you to discover what style of writing suits you best. And that's part of the fun of the exploration of writing. So always be happy when you write. So after you've figured out your topic and then you've already written your associated ideas, now it's time to organize those ideas. And so then once you have your, you know your, your topic, your reasons, your central ideas, and your subtopics, then it's time to organize those ideas into an outline. So let's get practical because we have pre-writing techniques that rock. Outlining. The true and tried technique is outlining because outlining gives the writer a roadmap to organized brilliance. Imagine you're gearing up to write a persuasive speech on the importance of voting. So here's how outlining comes to the rescue. So here I have an example essay of a student who wrote about why it's so important to vote. So that's what this outline is going to be about. Outline. So in your introduction, you always have three parts to your introduction paragraph. You have a hook where you start with a compelling statistic or quote about voter turnout. So what would happen if nobody voted in the United States? What would happen if uh, everybody just stayed home to watch TV? Then who would rule the country? Would, the, would a king rule a country? Would a dictator rule the country? So start with a compelling idea of what if there were no, nobody voting? Then you introduce the topic. Explain the significance of voting in a democratic society. So first you have your hook. Then you have five background sentences that explains the context of your thesis statement. 
So here in this voting essay, you're going to explain why it's important for everybody to go out and vote. And then the very last sentence of your, para of your introduction would be your main idea sentence, where you're going to state the, um, your topic, your um, outline, your, your opinion, and then you say your topic, opinion, and reason. So TOR. So that's your thesis statement formula. So that your thesis statement is always the last sentence of the first paragraph and the first sentence the last paragraph. So a good uh, thesis statement would be voting is important because reason one, reason two, reason three. Voting would be the um, topic, is important, is uh, the opinion, and then you have reason one, reason two, reason three. And then reason one, reason two, reason three will become your body paragraph. So whatever, you, whatever the three reasons that you put in your thesis statement then becomes paragraph two, reason one, paragraph three, reason two, paragraph four, reason three. So that's what we're going to do next. So after you write your introduction, then you have your body paragraphs. So the three reasons why voting is important. Voting is important because of civic in engagement, representation of the people uh, for, for the government, and then change and progress of each leader that comes and goes based on what you, who you vote for. So these are the three reasons that would be included. So voting is important because of civic engagement, so that becomes because of representation and because of change and progress. So that the three reasons of your uh, thesis statement will then become the three reasons for your body paragraphs. And then you have your, so here you have your, your topic sentence. Um, voting is important because of civic engagement. Um, voting is important because of representation. And voting is important because of change and progress. And then this is the topic sentence, which is the main idea of your paragraph. Each paragraph, five to seven sentences. So you have your topic sentence, and then you're going to have five sentences that explains civic engagement, representation. Then you're going to have five sentences that explains uh, representation. Then you have change in progress. Then you're going to have five sentences that talks about change and progress. So explain how voting is a fundamental aspect of civic participation. Provide examples of historical events influenced by voting. Representation. Discuss how voting ensures diverse voices are heard in government. Mention the importance of diverse representation for fair policies. Change and progress. Highlight how voting can drive societal change and progress. Give examples of laws or policies shaped by voter input. Now, if any of you want to use this topic for your persuasive essay, go right ahead. Okay, go right ahead. That's, that's fine by me. Okay, so um, remember, that the body of your, of, your, of your essay, it's kind of like the meat of your hamburger. You remember that hamburger chart I gave you? And so the introduction is the upper bun, then the meat of your essay, that's the body paragraph, and then the lower bun, that's your conclusion paragraph. So now we're coming upon the conclusion paragraph. Oh, the counter argument. So the counter, so if you want, this part is, um, it's required if you're taking English 105, you are required to have this counter-argument paragraph. And by the time I'm talking about this, in week five of English 105, you will be asked to write a counter-argument paragraph. And so if you're in English 101, this is totally uh, voluntary on your part. If you're up to the challenge, you go for it. So what is a counter-argument paragraph? A counter-argument paragraph means you talk about the other side. In other words, if I were to say that abortion is immoral, then I'm, then, and that's my argument, my main argument is abortion is immoral, well then the, the other side, because counter-argument is when you talk about the other side, and the other side would be abortion is moral because it's the woman's choice, it's her body, okay? So then you mention the other side, then you pivot to your side, and you would say, however, in other words, many women think, 
abortion is moral because they believe that abortion, uh, that every woman has the right to, 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 to make choices about her body. Okay, so mention what the other side says. Then you pivot to your argument. However, many people feel, also feel that abortion is immoral because um, life uh, is conceived by God and should not be taken away by a doctor or something like that, okay? In other words, you write about the other side, then you write however, and then you write your argument. And so when you include a counter-argument paragraph in your argument, it, it strengthens your argument and makes your paper look fair and balanced. And so you can stick your counter-argument uh, and rebuttal paragraph right after your fourth reason. So that's where they're, they're doing it. And so counter-argument is where you address potential counter-arguments against voting. Refute these arguments with logical reasoning and evidence. Okay, so we're going back to our voting uh, a paper, right? And so remember that the three reasons. Voting is important because of representation, because of diversity, um, because of, uh, I forget what, what they were. Hold on. And so in our, so the body paragraphs, voting is important because of civic engagement, representation, change in progress. And then you would write, some people think it's not important to vote. Some people think that um, you know, the parliament should elect the leader or legislators should elect the leader because people do not know any better or people may be too uneducated to vote for a leader. However, uh, however it is, uh, I believe that, or however, voting is important because it is essential that the people express their views so that you have a diverse voices in government. In other words, you pivot to your argument and you simply repeat what you said in your body paragraphs. So you refute. So you say the other side, however, and then you go back to your original thesis statement of voting is important because. So that's where you would add at the end of, and if you're taking English 105, you already know this. Then after you write your uh, after you write your counter argument and rebuttal paragraph, then you write your conclusion paragraph. In the conclusion, you're going to repeat the thesis statement as the first sentence of the last paragraph. Then you're going to summarize the main points of your essay. And so in the conclusion, you will recap the importance of voting for civic engagement, representation, and progress. And, and then your conclusion can be a call to action. In other words, you encourage the audience to go register and vote in upcoming elections. Leave a lasting impression. End with a memorable quote for unity. In other words, everybody should go out and vote. In other words, in the conclusion, you tell the reader what to do. You give a prediction of the future for in the future, if everybody votes, uh, then the country will have a democratic government or something like that. So you give a prediction for the future and you give closure in your, con in your conclusion. And then that's the end of your paper. In other words, what takeaway lessons should the reader have for reading your paper? And so this ends the typical, the typical style or structure of a five paragraph essay. So when we write essays, we're dealing with nonfiction, not fiction. Okay. Fiction, when we deal with fiction, then we could deal with our imagination and fantasy, and that's creative writing. And then when we deal with nonfiction and writing essays, that's known as academic writing. So you have two different kinds of writing. English 101 and English 105 focuses on academic writing, where we mainly deal with nonfiction. And then English 115, which is introduction to literature and creative writing, then we deal with fiction. So that's the difference between creative writing and then uh, nonfiction. Fiction and nonfiction writing. So, uh, no, I haven't finished this, this. Now the next part of this PowerPoint, I'm going to talk about week six. What motivates you to, to write? What are the reasons why people want to write? What's the purpose of writing? And so in nonfiction, mainly the purpose in writing is to inform, educate, 
persuade, or entertain. Those are the four main um, purposes of non-fictional writing for the most part. And so, but now we're gonna, now I'm gonna go into uh, more general of why people write, both creatively as well, both both for non-fiction and fiction. So that's what I'm gonna cover in the second half of this. Uh, of this, uh, so motivations to write. So writing is a journey, and every writer embarks on it for various reasons. Let's delve into the motivations that fuel writers' creativity. The first reason, self-expression. For many, for many, writing is a means of expressing thoughts, emotions, and personal experiences. It's a way to share your unique perspective with the world leaving a piece of your soul on the page. Think about it. Whenever you enter a library and you take out a book, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, that author has left a piece of his soul in that book. So when you are reading a book uh, from the last century, you're reading a bunch of books about dead people or dead people's souls. So that's why if you write a really good book, and long after you're dead, your characters, you, the story that you write, lives on forever. So it's a kind of immortality, you know, self-expression, because you leave a bit of yourself on this earth long after you're gone. Story. So another reason, that's, that's one reason why people write, self-expression, posterity. Uh, another reason is human beings are hardwired for stories. Writers love crafting narratives that transport readers to different worlds, introduce them to intriguing characters, engage their imagination. Whether it is through novels, short stories, or scripts, storytelling is a magnetic force for writers. And so when we tell a story, especially one that's universal, you get to experience what other writers in other centuries have experienced enabling you to understand what it's like to be Chinese American, what it's like to be African American, what it's like to be European American in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, what it's like to be a woman in the early 20th century when women could not own property and women were considered the property of men. So when we read good literature, it, it enlarges our horizons, allows us to feel empathy for the character, and allows us to experience other people's adventures from the safety of our couch. And so writing, is, and this is true for both fiction and nonfiction, and so storytelling is indeed a magnetic force for writers. The healing power of writing, catharsis and healing. Writing can serve as a therapeutic outlet it is a space where writers can confront their feelings, work through traumas, and find healing. Pouring emotions onto the page can provide a sense of release and clarity. I remember reading a book. It was called The Invisible Daughter. And she, this, this daughter was raised in a family where she was invisible, where the mother and father paid all their attention on the son and totally ignored their daughter. And so as she wrote the book, she poured out her feelings of abandonment, loneliness, sadness, betrayal, pain onto those pages. And then as you read, you reread, you re-examine, re, uh, and you re-experience her pain. And you re-experience what it's like to be a daughter that's in invisible to their parents while the son is put on this pedestal. And so it's a kind of catharsis and healing because you know that the reader will empathize with you, that the reader is going to pay attention to you and your feelings. So that's why writing is a source of catharsis and healing because you have a, a captive audience in your reader in which the reader will absorb what you wrote and feel what you feel so that you, the writer, no longer feels alone. So that's the cathartic effect of writing. Communication and connection. This is the empathy part I'm talking about. Writing bridges gaps and connects people across time and space. 
Writers communicate ideas, knowledge, and experiences to readers who might be continents away. It's a way to create lasting connections and spark, connect and spark conversations. Exploration and advocacy. Advocacy and change. Writers are change makers. Through essays, articles, and persuasive pieces, they shed light on social issues raise awareness, advocate for change. The power of the written word can galvanize movements and shape public opinion. For me, I Have a Dream by Martin Luther King. To me, that is the best persuasive essay and speech I've, that's ever been written, that's ever been written. Because in that speech for advocacy and change, Martin Luther King was advocating for the end of racism. Martin Luther King wanted everyone to be aware of how racism hurts and wanted everyone to be aware because once you become aware of a social issue, then you can do something about it. And so uh, Martin Luther King, you've got to read, I have a dream. And so writing is a way for advocacy and change. It's a way for uh, uh, Americans to move forward. And it's also a way for the writer to give voice to whatever um, causes he or she finds important and wants change. So when you become a writer, then you can advocate for change in the causes that you feel strongly about. So for Martin Luther King, she, he felt strongly about putting an end to racism once and for all. And it can galvanize people into action. And so when you write a really good persuasive piece, you can galvanize a, a whole nation and galvanize a whole historical period named after you. So that's the power of the written word. Another reason for writing is exploration and curiosity. Writers are explorers of both external and internal realms. They seek to understand the world around them and the depths of human nature. Writing is an avenue for curiosity, a way to question, learn, and grow. Edith Wharton. So I'm thinking Edith, the exploration of human nature. That is so Edith Wharton. So Edith Wharton lived in the beginning of the 20th century and she was a penniless spinster. And in Europe, if you're a woman and you don't get married and you're poor, you're looked down upon. And so Edith, Edith Wharton lived with her rich relatives. And her rich relatives would give all these parties where all the rich people would get together. And because Edith Wharton was old and unmarried, they, everybody ignored her. So she quietly sat in the corner and she quietly observed the parties without saying much. Then at night, when everybody went to bed, Edith Wharton would write. And boy, would she write such a satire. She made fun of all those snobby people at the parties that totally ignored her. She would write things like, the very fat guy farted. Well, he, she didn't put it in those words, but she would make fun of the guy who happens to be fat or who happens to have no hair and who happens to have bad breath or, or, or says all of these um, things, that hypocritical things. Like he says one thing but does another, that sort of thing. And then when people read her books, they know who she's talking about. Marcel Proust did the same thing. Everybody ignored Marcel Proust because he was Jewish. And so when Marcel Proust came out with his book and, and he made fun of, of, the, of the, the French aristocracy, he put just enough detail in there and then everybody was laughing at, at that person. So exploration of human nature, that's, that's, uh, that's what Edith Wharton, oh, she got back at him. She got back at him for, for being so snobby to her, you know. So that quiet little spinster is the one that lives on forever, you see. It's her word, and she gets the last laugh when you think about it. And then curiosity. Writing is an avenue for curiosity, a way to question, learn, and grow. And so when we read the caricatures of these people, we learn how not to behave. We learn to see that, that kind of person in the people around us. And then we learn not to be like that because then we become aware that, that, that if you behave a certain way, then you are going to turn people off. You know, so that's a way to learn the culture around you. So you got to read Edith Wharton. I think it's an age of innocence. She wrote many books, but that's when I, as soon as I saw exploration of human nature, I thought Edith Wharton. 
Advocacy and change, I thought Martin Luther King. Legacy and immortality. Words have the ability to outlive their creators. Writers yearn to leave, to leave a lasting impact, a legacy that future generations can cherish. From classic literature to personal memoirs, writing ensures that their voice endures. Legacy and immortality, I think Chaucer. See, Chaucer was an English writer. He's considered the father of English literature. And so when Chaucer was thrown into prison because he did not pay his bills, in the old days in England, if you don't pay your bills, they throw you into prison. And that was known as debtor, a debtor uh, jail. So there he was in prison and he didn't have a penny to rub together. And so the guard then said, okay, you owe the state so, mu so much money. And then Chaucer said, but I don't have any money. I don't have anything. I don't even have a wallet, okay? Then the guard looks Chaucer up and down and Chaucer's just wearing these dirty clothes. Then, 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 then the guard goes, take off your clothes. We'll take your clothes from you and to help pay off your debt. Chaucer was outraged. What? You're going to have me go naked? And the, the guard goes, yeah, well, you owe all this money, and you're a deadbeat. So deadbeats don't deserve any kind of dignity, says the guard. So he made Chaucer, the guard made Chaucer take off all his clothes. He gave, and Chaucer gave the, his clothes to the guard. And then as the guard was walking away from the jail with Chaucer's clothes, you know, he, Chaucer said, you'll pay for this. Someday I'm going to become a famous writer and I'm going to live on, you know, in, I'm going to live on in, in immortality when I write the story about you and I'm going to make you, the guard, the bad guy. Everybody in, for forever going to laugh at you. Of course, the guard didn't listen to a dirty, poor, uh, naked man, so he walked away laughing. But who got the last laugh in the end? Chaucer. Chaucer got the last laugh because now that that guard is forever a comical figure in Chaucer's stories. So legacy and immortality. So always be nice to a writer because you never know which writer will turn out to be the next Chaucer. And then in fictional writing, one of the one of, uh, uh, a main reason for fictional writing is escape from reality. Da -na, na, 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 na. Star Trek. Yes, you guessed it. For me, escape from reality means watching a great Star Trek episode. So the motivation behind, uh, some, uh, behind uh, science fiction writing is writing is a refuge, a way to escape the worries and constraints of reality. Let's explore how seeking solace from the chaos drives writers to put pen to paper. And so life can be overwhelming at times, and writing provides a much needed escape. Whether it's through fantasy worlds, science fiction realms, or historical settings, writers create alternate realities where they can temporarily set aside their own concerns. Writing becomes a portal to freedom, a haven where worries dissolve as imagination takes flight. Da -na, da -da 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 -da. Gene Roddenberry. So if you're Gene Roddenberry, you sit down and you create your sci-fi world, you escape reality. And you also help the reader escape. So it's not just the, the writer that escapes rea reality, but the reader does too. And also creative freedom and catharsis in fictional writing. So in the realm of creative writing, you're the architect of your universe. You decide the rules, the characters, and the outcome. And this creative freedom is liberating. It allows you to construct scenarios where problems have solutions, where justice prevails, and where the impossible becomes possible. So you get to put the stab the knife through the heart of the bad guy, okay? You get to strangle the bad guy after writing what a hideous person he is. Then you get the satisfaction of killing him off, okay? And so that kind of creative freedom in which you decide the fate of each character, you're the one who puts the thoughts into each character. That's known as omni uh, third person, omnipotent, omnis omniscient narrator. 
but you get you have total control and you decide the fate of everybody so that is part of the liberating fun part of writing and so uh, that's the creative freedom of writing you just you just heard that that siren go by right so you could create a story about that siren what who is in trouble what emergency is is causing that ambulance to go by and so then you have the creative freedom to create your own world to live in okay catharsis and emotional release when reality becomes too heavy to bear writing provides a safe outlet authors infuse their feelings into their characters allowing them to experience and process emotions on their behalf this catharsis can be incredibly therapeutic offering a release from pent-up frustrations and anxieties so i could write about myself and i'm a star trek astronaut walking on mars so i can do things that i cannot do in real life we can no, we cannot yet travel to mars but when you write uh, fictional writing you create your own fun world and it's kind of like an emotional release to be able to to put yourself into different adventures you're running after the, the monsters you're on jurassic park uh, looking at the beautiful dinosaurs and that sort of thing and so part of the fun of fictional writing is what you, what, what we call world building that means you build a fictional world in which you get to play in. So that is part of the fun of fiction writing. You can't really do that in nonfiction, in essay writing. In essay writing, everything has to be about the truth. Everything has to be factual. So that fictional writing is actually a lot more fun than uh, certain kinds of nonfiction writing. Okay, so let's move on. Another reason for uh, fun in writing is empowerment and control. In the pages of a story, writers have absolute control. They can rewrite past mistakes, uh, navigate uncharted territories, confront challenges head on. This empowerment seeps into their real lives, giving them confidence to tackle their own struggles. Finding hope and resilience through writing, individuals can shape narratives that embody resilience and hope. So many Star Trek stories do that. And so the Star Trek stories always have a positive ending. Always the world is a better place. And the setting of Star Trek is also full of hope, where all of the nations of the world have overcome all of their wars, all of their conflicts. Hunger has been, uh, you know, there's no hunger anymore. There's no war anymore. And so everyone is just going on space exploration. And so, in, um, so you can find hope and resilience in writing, even in the darkest tales, the presence of characters overcoming adversity offers a glimmer of optimism. This optimism can extend beyond the page, reminding writers that challenges can be surmounted. Nurturing the imagination. And so imagination is a boundless playground. So uh, Hans Christian Andersen, now that, he was, he created a lot of the fairy tales that you know of, like, um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but he, Hans Christian Andersen created a lot of classic fairy tales, like Sleeping Beauty, and he was, he, he was um, accused of walking down the street, and he would, and, and Hans Christian Andersen would walk down the street totally unaware of his surroundings, because he was so busy thinking up new stories for his fairy tale books. And so there's one story where Hans Christian Andersen fell in love with a woman, but she had absolutely no interest in him. And so what happens is that every time he would pass by her house, he would imagine a world in which she was a very cold queen, the ice queen, and she's in her mountain. And what she does is that she touches someone she, and freezes the entire kingdom you see. And so I think there is a story by Hans Christian Andersen about the Ice Queen, which was based on, and, and so people would try to say, hey Hans, how are you doing? He would walk right by, not even know you're there or something, because, and then, and then they would have to shake your, he would have to shake, shake his, his shoulders, Hans, are you there? Oh yeah, oh, because he, he'd get so lost, he would get so lost in his imaginary world. 
And so that's part of the fun of fiction writing is they get to nurture the imagination. So that 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 the girlfriend that ter that that didn't like him uh, becomes the ice cream the ice queen of in his fairy tales. So yes, imagination is a boundless playground where rules don't apply. Writers who seek solace, oh, writers who seek solace in their creative mus musings, nurture a vibrant imagination. Hans Christian Andersen, by indulging in imaginative imaginative worlds, they fuel their inner child and find comfort in the extraordinary. Temporary re reprieve is another reason why people write. Life's challenges often require a pause button. Writing provides that pause, allowing writers to step away from their immediate troubles. As they immerse themselves, in other words, as writers immerse themselves in crafting stories, the outside world fades into the background, providing temporary relief. So you've got to read the biography of Hans Christian Andersen, and that is a true. That actually is a true story. He'd walk around and not even be aware of where he was. Finding beauty in God's creation, Emily Dickinson. Yep. See, I can. As soon as I read it, I'm thinking, Yep, Emily Dickinson poems. A lot of poetry, such as um, Japanese poetry, like haiku, has to do with finding beauty in nature or finding beauty in God's creation. So writing it can be a spiritual uh, adventure in which we look at nature because God gave everybody the ability to admire his creation. He gave all humans that innate ability, the awe in front of nature to, to, to appreciate God's uh, creation. And so writing, writing about that awe feels so good. So writing is a spiritual journey, a way to connect with the divine through the act of creation, through the act of writing. Let's delve into how writers are inspired by the beauty of God's creation and how it manifests itself in their writing. So when you write poetry, you can find beauty in God's creation. The world we inhabit is a masterpiece of divine artistry. Writers often find solace, inspiration, and a deep sense of connection when they immerse themselves in the natural world. From the grandeur of the mountains to the delicate petals of a flower, every element of creation is a testament to the Creator's, in other words, God's, boundless imagination. Nature as a metaphor. Writers often draw parallels between the natural world and human experiences. They find metaphors in the changing seasons, the cycle of life, and death, and the resilience of plants after a storm. These metaphors remind readers of the divine patterns that shape both nature and our lives. Writing becomes a bridge to spiritual reflection. As writers contemplate the intricate designs of the universe, they ponder the mysteries of existence, the purpose of life, and the interconnectedness of all living things. In this introspection, they find spiritual fulfillment. If you read the Bible, Genesis, you see the, how beautiful nature and the creation of nature is. And nature as a metaphor is used a lot in books. Uh, for, for example, when a person is extremely sad, the writer would place the character in a, at a funeral and it would rain. And rain has been used a lot to symbolize sadness. And so that you have the double double symbolism of the funeral and uh, the, the tears of the rain to symbolize the ultimate sadness and turning point in the life of that uh, character. And so nature can be used as a metaphor, such as old man winter. So anytime you have someone dying, any kind of illness, uh, old age, that's all winter time. Springtime comes to represent renewal, youth. Everything gets to start over again. And summer is, is a time of celebration when you're when the it's like the flower in full bloom. And so many writers do use nature as a metaphor for the human condition. Connection with the divine. In the act of writing, writers commune with the divine uh, a divine creator. And so that you let the thoughts of God flow through you in through your pen 
and you write down what God is thinking. So some people, if you really calm down, you can actually hear God's voice as you write what you say, what he says. And so writers express gratitude for the gift of language, for the gift of language through which writers can honor and celebrate the beauty that surrounds them. Writing then becomes a form of spiritual devotion, a way to offer their talents back to the one who created all things. A lot of the art of the Renaissance, uh, the, the artists would draw pictures of angels and draw pictures of Jesus and draw a lot of spiritual. So if you look to the European Renaissance, a lot of um, artists uh, felt God flow through them as they drew the picture of, of the angels. Think of Michelangelo and the, 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 the chapel, the Sistine Chapel, as you look up and you see all those angels. So here you have the connection with the divine. So it's not just writing, but all kinds of art and painting. Conclusion. As writers, we're granted the privilege of translating the wonders of God's creation into the realm of words. Each sentence, each metaphor becomes an offering of praise and gratitude. The act of creation through writing becomes an echo of the divine act of creation itself. So let your pen be the artist's brush, your words, the strokes on the canvas of existence. In writing, you discover the beauty that resides in every leaf, in every star, and every heart. You, your writing is a reflection of the Creator's masterpiece. Happy writing, and may your words always be a hymn to the Creator's artistry. So now I end on that note. So all of my art, and yeah, I did create these paintings, okay? All of my art, and I always felt inspired by the divine. I always felt so good after do, uh, creating art. And I could feel so calm because I knew that what I was creating came from him. And so when you write, no matter how tired you are, at the, just like I, I, I said in the very beginning, Writing takes self-discipline. You have to, after a hard day of work, you have to make yourself get into the zone. And once you get into the zone of writing, it's totally worth it. So herein ends my how to do pre-writing, how to write an outline, and how to motivate writers to write. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me anytime.